Hi, Alt Space Up audience. Today I'm getting more clues to see what this episode is about. Do you think that one million Vietnam Dong is too expensive to be dressed? Mm, they're oh. arguing, they're debating, they're haggling. Interesting. Nicely, yeah. nicely done, nicely done. Great cup Successfully. Good Negotiate. job, good job, guys. <laughs> people negotiating, people uh, haggling each other. I think this episode might be about negotiations. Let's see who our guest is. My name is Pham San Cho. I was born in Myanmar and grew up in the Middle East. I was a soldier, a teacher, and I spent 35 years in my life in promoting Vietnamese culture, and I'm proud of the job I'm doing. Wow, what a powerful person. I'm fangirling right now, I'm a little bit nervous, but I'm so excited, so let's see. Yay, let's go see your guest. Welcome back to the IELTS Face Off studio, and I'm so happy that we're, we are actually able to begin our talk with Ambassador Seng Cho. I think that's fantastic that you're here today with us. Thank you so much for being here. Delighted to be here and thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah, with a lot of questions and I'm very, very excited to be able to ask you that today here today. Please go ahead. Actually, one of the first things that we have received a lot from our audience is actually what does it take to become a diplomat? I think in order to be a good diplomat, that requires you a passion. You need to have love with the job and then you need to develop your mm. linguistic skill. You need to be able to speak different languages, at least more than one foreign language. Mm. And number three, you need to have a good comment of international relations, political science, mm. international law, economics. Mm. So this is a, we call the basic knowledge. And then you need to develop or acquire uh, soft skills, like being able to talk to the public. Mm -hmm. So combine, you need to get all this in order to become a good diplomat. Mm. You came from a family with yes, I do. a tradition of diplomacy. Mm. Do you think family tradition helped you to become a better diplomat? Oh, it does. I was born overseas. I traveled with my parents. I got exposed to that experience. I think that I grew with the job in the Foreign Service. and. Um, I don't know, I learned uh, or I inherit a gene mm -hmm. from my parents. So it, it does help. You mentioned something about discipline. Yes. Uh, you were telling me discipline is extremely important um, in your job. Mm -hmm. What are some of basically the instances where you really had to actually challenge your discipline? I consider the job of uh, Foreign Service as a soldier. Mm at a peace time. So like any soldier, you need to follow your superior mm -hmm. command and instruction. So a sense of discipline is the most important in our career because sometimes we have to act according to the instructions of the leaders, those who can see very well where lies the national interest. Mm. Because our job is to protect the national interest of Vietnam, the interest of the people, and the image of the country. Mm. And sometimes you are not in a position to see all these different interests, and our leaders, they look the interest of the country much better. So you need to follow that instruction. So I think that is very important for you. You have to be loyal to your country. You have to be loyal to the interests of your nation. I think you mentioned something that is extremely valuable. You work for the benefit of the country and of course the benefit of the nation and the benefit of the people has mm -hmm. to be first. Right, right. Um, and so have you, when you were working for the benefits of all of these people, made sacrifices? Um, in the past, from your personal life and also from your family as well? Oh yes, any job requires a different kind of uh, sacrifice. But uh, for Foreign Service, I think that there are a number of different kinds of sacrifice that a diplomat has to make. You have to live away from your culture, your homeland, away from the one you love. And sometimes that happened to a lot of my friends and my colleagues when their parents pass away mm. They are not there. 
So this is the most painful moment in your life when your beloved one passed away and you're not, not able to attend the, the funeral or you're not able to see them the last time before they die. That is very difficult. Or for your children, they keep changing their education environment and they are not able to maintain a long-lasting friendship with their friends. And sometimes you cannot do what you really like. I think there is untold story of all these challenges, all these sacrifices that a foreign service... I love the fact that you shared such an open idea of these sacrifices mm -hmm. because I also think, you know, a lot of us young generation, when we think about, you know, this foreign service, mm -hmm. it still seems like something that's very glamorous. Mm -hmm. It's very idealistic. It is, it is yeah. sometimes, yes, yeah. but not all the ways. Yes. So what is your advice to, to some young people who are interested in foreign service? The first thing I want to tell them that uh, diplomacy is one of the most noble profession that I have known. Being a lawyer, being a uh, medical doctor are all good. But uh, being a foreign service officer is very important because you serve your own country. You need to protect the interest and the image of your country. You need to serve in the way that to ensure that this country, Vietnam in particular, be able to enjoy a sustainable environment which is safe, which is secure, needed for economic and social development of the country. Your mission is so important and you feel that, okay, I love this job. I feel that I am inclined by the appealingness of this job and I'm ready to be a disciplined soldier. I'm ready to learn and to acquire all the necessary knowledges needed to become a good diplomat in order to be able to serve our country best. And in that sense, I'm ready to give up some ego in myself and only be creative within the framework of the job. But for those who really want to be very creative, those who want to, to be themselves all the time, I don't think diplomacy is a appropriate job for them. Mm. I think that's a fantastic advice. Diplomacy. Diplomacy is a job with a lot of weight. Yes. It is a, a job with a lot of responsibilities. Yes, it does. And I think it's a job with a lot of, I think, confidentiality to the safety of the nation. Yes. Mm. Do you believe in family legacy and do you wish for your kids to also follow your path? I believe that family value is the most important. Like any other parents, we would like to see a very good career life for my children. But I think it's, it's, uh, I also want my children to keep the tradition that I follow the footsteps of my parents. I hope they will be able to do the same. But they are now adult mm. and they can make their own decision. Yes. <laughs> I can only advise mm. and until now, none of them Enjoy the foreign service. <laughs> I see. I'm so happy that you give your children the flexibility and the freedom mm -hmm. to also make their own decisions. And now you sitting here and sharing with me, I think it also feels like you have this openness to actually allowing them to do whatever they feel passionate about. Correct. Yeah. The most important that you need to have a passion. Mm. If you don't have passion, no matter how hard you try, you will be not successful in your career. Mm because passion needs to come first. Now that we're talking about passion, mm -hmm. is passion a major part of your life motto? And what is your life motto? It is a blessing to be born in life. So you need to find yourself a certain happiness mm -hmm. or all the way happiness. Because without happiness, life will be very miserable. So for me, in order to be able to find yourself happy, mm -hmm. you need to be useful every single moment. I really love that advice. A lot of the times, us young people, we spend, you know, probably 70 to 80% of the time thinking about, you know, what's our day going to be? Uh, what are some of the things that we can do to make ourselves happy? Mm -hmm. But I think you mentioned something that is so important in the sense that with all of our thoughts, we should at least be spending a certain amount of our time, not just thinking about what we can do for the mm -hmm. world because we are a part of it, but also how we can act to ensure that we can create change in the world at Correct. large. You know, given the fact that you've told me all of that, Mr. Ambassador, I'm also really, really interested, of course, along with our audience, to find out what are some of the most amazing things that Vietnamese people, as well as foreigners, need to try when they actually go to Vietnam. 
So, Mr. Ambassador, can you advise us? In terms of food, what is the one dish or multiple dishes that a foreigner or a Vietnamese person needs to try? Vietnamese noodle pho, pho it's, it is wonderful. You can eat at any time and it is very popular. It is a genuine, authentic dish of Vietnam. So what is the one place in Vietnam where a Vietnamese or a foreign person should visit, in your opinion? It's very hard to say that one place, right? Because Vietnam has so many things to offer and you cannot decline the temptation mm. to go to these different places because everything has a different characteristic. So I guess, you know, a foreigner or a Vietnamese should just check them out all because I do think Vietnam has multiple, multiple things, as you said, to offer. Yes, the land, the sea, the mountains. Mm -hmm. the, and the people. The people. The most attractive things that Vietnam can offer is the people, mm. the friendliness. Mm. Anywhere you travel, the people tend to be very friendly, mm. hospitable. Mm. I think you just answered my last question, which was basically, what is the most amazing thing, in your opinion, about Vietnamese people? And hospitality. Hospitality. Is your answer. And forgiveness. Mm. When you are able to forgive, then it comes your hospitality. Mm -hmm. If you are not able to forgive, forgive for the suffering that other people inflicted on you, how can you be hospitable? Mm -hmm. That, I think, is such a profound observation of mm -hmm. our country. Mm -hmm. And I think it also explains many, many things that we have been able to achieve and to do throughout history. Mm -hmm. And especially in the recent history, where, you know, I think Vietnam has definitely become one of the major tourist destinations in the world. Mm -hmm. And people love to come to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. It's a very profound observation to kind of connect forgiveness and hospitality together. Mm -hmm. I think that's beautiful. Thank you so much, Ambassador Seng Cho, for actually most joining welcome. us today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, in IELTS Face Off, we'd like to introduce you to a lot of books that might make your studying or might make your life a little bit more meaningful. And today, we're actually going to find out what our ambassador's favorite book is. So Ambassador Sang Joe, what is your favorite book? One of the most uh, favorite books that I love is uh, the novel Gone with the Wind. I like Gone with the Wind because I started um, my reading with uh, this book, but I like the uh, Scarlet. Mm. And one of her characteristics I like most is that uh, she's very stubborn mm. and determined to go forward. Each time when I make difficulties and I feel a little bit stressful in life, I remember mm. her saying, tomorrow will be another day. Today, we may not succeed, but tomorrow we will succeed. So keep trying. Yeah. That is the motto of the novel. Well, thank you for that recommendation. That's beautiful. And guys, if you're looking to actually purchase a book, um, you can always find your books on tiki.vn, and that's where you can just sit at home and browse through all of those titles and find a book that you like. Yeah, and uh, we hope to see you back again, hopefully one day in the Thank future. Thank you. I hope too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, on IELTS On The Go, we are going to meet three young students, but with undeniably fluent English. Tung Dak and IELTS On The Go this episode will make you stop at Lotus Lake in Hanoi for a talk with these amazing youngsters. And of course, we are so excited for the voice of this week. We will enter the room to sit the test with our IELTS expert in their real-time speaking test. Your favorite part of the show is coming right now. The IELTS expert section of IELTS Face Off, and today we have Lily back again. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Hi, thanks, Phoebe. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's always great to have you here. So, before we actually go on to Lily and her advice, we actually have our friend, our lovely friend Chen Tung, who's going around the country and showing you guys a snippet of all the real and regular and amazing people that he meets along his way. So, let's go on to the IELTS on the go section.
Hello Phoebe, hello Lily. Uh, here I am on this beautiful Lotus Pond as you can see. And here I have with me today three very talented young individuals. So young you won't be able to guess their age. So let's get to know them a little bit. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? I'm doping off. I'm turning 16 this year. I've started my English learning journey since I was four years old. My name is Guiang. I'm also 16. I am Hung and I'm 14 years old. I have been learning English for about five years. I'm sure you guys started pretty young. Is that something that you actively get involved with or is it something that your parents kind of wean you on uh, at an early stage in your life? Well, at first it's just my parents overthinking. Like, since English is getting more popular, they want me to study English to get better opportunities in life. Well, actually, when I start studying English, there's some that kind of aura that attracts me to it. So uh, I think uh, this is uh, the common story for a lot of people in Vietnam, where uh, parents really want to, they are hell-bent on trying to raise bilingual children, right? But uh, you also talk about like this attraction that you find with English, which is really interesting. Do you? find the same way do you find like English has this aura that kind of draws you in when you first started out? Yeah, I did. I find that playing games with classmates and the foreign teachers is really awesome. So I find that English was attractive and it's, it's still attractive. Okay. Yep. A part of your interest in English uh, can be attributed to the interesting uh, activities and uh, sort of like the people that you study with, right? Yeah. Do you think that uh, your hobbies kind of contribute to your process of learning English as well? Yes, because uh, playing video games uh, will help you uh, find new words so I can learn from that. And a lot of the vocabulary that I learned from the video games that I've played as well, right? Because, you know, when you have this connection with what you're interacting with, it, the knowledge kind of just comes naturally to you. Uh, and is this the same for you? Actually, I do play lots of video games, well, for girls. When we uh, travel to other countries or when we study at the other components of the world, we can't just use, well, formal academic uh, kind of English that it's we true. use at school. It's true. So, I mean, when we play games, we get to meet other people. We get to use that kind of casual side of English. And that's what's important when you go to other countries because you can't just meet a friend and say my humble apologies. Uh, yeah, that, that would be so unnatural, right? And you touch on a very interesting point because um, I think when people study the IELTS, uh, study for the IELTS, uh, they kind of think that they have to be all formal and stuff. You know, they kind of have to up their vocabulary game. And I think this is an interesting segue into the, the next um, you know, section of our show, uh, which is about the IELTS. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, vocabulary building. Uh, you talked a lot about, you know, not focusing too much on the more academic, but more about how native speakers actually use the language. Okay, so um, how do you build your vocabulary? When we were young, we would be more attractive to familiar words that are in mm. our lives and like words are in the same subject. So I just basically learn um, words in one subject and okay. then move to another subject. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's a very smart approach to things because then you would, you know, you would cover like a broad range of spectrum and you would have like things to talk about different topics in life, right? Both, you know, vocabulary wise and you have a lot of ideas as well, which is very useful in uh, the IELTS writing and speaking tests, okay? Yeah. So on IELTS on the go, we give people a lot of opportunities to, to practice speaking. You guys are all studying for the IELTS, right? Yeah. And yeah. practice tests are important uh, because you're here with me today. I have a little gift for you. Uh, you guys get to sit in a simulation exam with oh. an IELTS expert from the British Council, but wow. we don't have time for all three of you to join the test, so just one person. Okay, you guys kind of have to decide among yourselves like which one is going to go. I think I'll leave you guys some time so that you guys can discuss, okay? Um, I have a pretty good idea who is going to be our contestant for today. Uh, I'm guessing the guy because he looks like uh, someone with a special weapon up his sleeve that he's not comfortable showing yet. But I think the discussion is getting pretty heated, so I'm going to have to bring him up. Okay. Uh, from from the look of things, I, I think you guys still haven't decided who is going to to go. True. Okay. So let's play a game of rock paper scissors. Okay. Winner. Winner gets to speak. Do it the old okay. school way. Okay. Rock, paper, scissors. 
Uh, so uh, we have with us today a very talented young man and he's going to uh, the exam room with us. Uh, are you nervous? Uh, yes, I'm really nervous. Okay, let me see. Uh, yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's nervous, all right. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to uh, take you to the exam room. Uh, just relax. Uh, the first uh, part of the speaking test is always going to be uh, kind of shaky, but you're going to regain the composure uh, as you go along. Okay, so shall we go? Yes. Let's do it. Well, our friend Dr. Thung has finally found somebody to face off. So, Lily, are you ready to face off? Yes, I am, Phoebe. Yeah, let's do it. Next. This boy decided to challenge himself with the real-time speaking test. How well he can manage the test? We will find out very soon. And for sure, every episode will be loaded with full upgrade vocabs, useful tips from our IELTS expert. Forget all the dead end cues and be confident. Mastering the IELTS speaking part two. How? Just wait and see. And in our new segment this season, Book of the Week, we will check out the book called IELTS Test Builder, the second edition. All will be brought to you right now. Welcome to your IELTS Face Off speaking test. Can you tell me your name, please? Oh, good morning. My name is Hug. Let's start with part one. What kind of clothes do you usually wear? Uh, usually, I wear street clothes such as a simple t shirt and jeans. I also uh, keen on basketball, so. I um, also wear the basketball jocks um, in general. My clothing style is very simple. Let's move now to part two. I'd like you to describe an interesting job that you'd like to have in the future. You have one minute to think about what you're going to say and you can make some notes if you wish. I want to be a doctor since I was a young boy. This job is really fit to me because I'm really good at science, especially in biology. I want to work in a well-known hospital so uh, I um, can have a high salary. Nowadays, the population has increasing rapidly, so many hospitals need a high-quality doctors. Once to be a doctor, you need mm, to a good personality, such as frank and trustworthy. Otherwise, a high-quality doctors need to know good about health, good performance, and well knowledgeable. I hope to be a doctor because I can help people to get over the disease and cancers. Doctors is a good paid job and my parents are really encouraging me to be a doctor. I also want to be a doctor in the future. Um, so I have been trying, trying every day to be a good student. And in the future, I can be a good doctor. Okay, let's move now to part three. What's the difference between blue collar and white collar jobs? In my opinion, blue collar is the job that um, they are work uh, by hand, the manager employing them to uh, work uh, in hour and in daily wage. Uh, about the white collar jobs, it's a job um, that um, people just need to use their brain, to thinking. Hey, thank you. That's the end of the speaking test. Thank you. Hey, there's our guy. Welcome back. Victorious? Uh, maybe. Maybe? Okay. How do you feel about the test? Part three in the speaking test is I think it's really hard for me. Okay. Part three was a little bit challenging. What, yes. what were the questions about? It's about the blue collars and white collars. Ah, blue collar and white collar workers. Yeah, I know it's always difficult because, you know, there, there will be questions about things that you haven't uh, had a lot of experience in yet. But don't worry, if you don't know a lot about something, you kind of just have to acknowledge that you don't know a lot and kind of just have to play along because the IELTS test is not a test of knowledge, it's a test of English, right? So it's only natural that you don't know a lot about the subjects, but you can still talk about them from your 
perspective. So uh, we've all heard uh, how you felt about the test, uh, but let's see how the examiner, the IELTS experts, actually felt about your performance. So Lily, what do you think of Hung's performance today? Oh, well, great. Some things that Hung should be really proud of. Um, he's got some really nice little chunks of language in there too. Um, he's got things like street clothes and um, a simple t-shirt. So it's great to be looking for those little bits of natural language where we've got the collocation, like the adjective noun, down pat, and it just sounds really natural. Um, I guess my biggest tip for Hung would be he was probably nervous. I mean, going on camera and speaking English, that's admirable. Um, but you really need to work on maybe just relaxing a little bit and then focusing on what we call pausing and chunking. That means finding the right place to breathe in between phrases. And also really importantly, it means finding the right part of the sentence to stress. For, for Hung, you gotta find those strong words and in English, it's the most important. More air, make them stronger a little bit softer on things like your article. Thank you, Miss Lily, for your invaluable feedback. And now we're going to uh, head back to the studio with more tips. Tips. tips and tips. Stay tuned for the tip section, you guys. My name is Tung Dang, and this is IELTS On The Go. So our tip is forget dead and cues. Yeah, so I think that's basically my understanding of, of the advice being given here is if you're in part two and you've got your main sort of topic there and you've got the prompts and if there's one you just don't understand it or there's a keyword you don't know, forget it. Don't let it throw you mentally. When you're in exam conditions, speaking a second language, it's a lot of a head game. So for sure, if there's a prompt that's, that's throwing you, don't let it throw you. Just set it aside um, and, and do your best to cover the topic. I guess for speaking part two though, most of the time it should be kind of clear what's on those prompts. It's a really nice part of the test, one that you can practice in terms of the timing. And also it's kind of a one-way communication, the candidate to the examiner. So it's a little less tenuous than the examiner firing questions at you. And my big tip probably for part two is use the prompts to organize what you're gonna say. You've got one minute planning time. Let's get real, that's basically nothing. So um, use those prompts to organize your key points. And then as you move from prompt to prompt when you're speaking, think about what kind of beautiful transition language uh, you can have to move from point to point uh, so you can smash it on the fluency and coherence. Hey Lily, when it mm -hmm. comes to negotiations and diplomacy and your know, passion and happiness, what idioms do you have for us? Ooh, <laughs> when it comes to those kinds of things, I like some of the sporting analogies for negotiating, like it's time to play hardball, mm. which just basically means if you've tried all the reasonable soft touch approaches, you've got to get direct. Mm. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. And for you guys looking to learn the IELTS at home, make sure you check out our news section and you're going to be able to learn about what are some of the books you can use and where you can buy them. So check out our books review section. Full complete practice test. In each test, there is further guidance and further practice content, which give comprehensive advice on how to approach specific areas of each skill in the IELTS exam. The best part of this book is the highly detailed answer keys, which explain each answer. I love the analogy of you know, the Ambassador Sang Cho's analogy to being a soldier at work. This show is just basically an excuse for us to really show you guys some really nice metaphors that you can use in life. So life can be hard, but I think all of us can be our own soldiers. And no matter what difficulties we go through, we can definitely use our military strength to get ourselves through the hard times. So that's it for this episode. Join us again always next time. We'll see you again. Bye-bye.